Keith Cole. Thank you, Mark. Good evening to all of you. I do have the privilege and pleasure to serve as the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. And we want to welcome you all here tonight for tonight's summer lecture series, Darkness 101, The Perils of Light Pollution. It is part of our ongoing environmental educational outreach. At this time, I first want to thank our presenting sponsors for the 2021 summer lecture series. Our corporate sponsor is Buckman, a Memphis-based corporation doing business around the world. Our foundational sponsor is the Crawford Howard Family Foundation, which has a long history in our community. We also want to thank our 2021 benefactors, beginning with Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, the Hyde Family Foundation, the Griffles Foundation, International Paper, Reen Container Technologies, and Chris Hill Construction. Thank you all for our corporate benefactors for your tremendous support. But of course, all of our supporters, corporations, community organizations, individuals, and all volunteers are critically important to allowing the Wolf River Conservancy to continue to deliver on our mission, which to, is to conserve and enhance the Wolf River and its watershed as a sustainable natural resource. Before we begin tonight's program, let me remind you that uh, we ask that you do not attempt to record uh, this program uh, with any device. Also, when you have questions during the program, please use the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Our education director, Kathy Justice, will be monitoring those questions. And at the end of the program, she will ask them uh, to our presenter. We're pleased to announce our presenter tonight is Charity Siebert. Charity grew up in the Finger Lakes, Re Finger Lakes region of upstate New York and believes that all people need wild spaces to experience connections with the natural world. Charity received her BS in geography at Jacksonville State University in Alabama. She went on to serve with the Catskill Outdoor Education Corps, uh, which was a part of AmeriCorps program that cemented her path as a naturalist and educator. She has worked in environmental education since 2004, first with the Little River Canyon Field Schools, followed by Oatland Island Wildlife Center, the Lichterman Nature Center, and most recently, the Memphis Botanic Gardens. She's completed several courses with the National Outdoor Leadership School. She has also served as a member at large on the board of the Tennessee Environmental Education Association for the past three years, and has been the chapter coordinator for the Memphis chapter of the Tennessee Nationalist Program since its formation in Memphis in 2012. Charity is now with the Pinecrest, Pinecrest Camp and Retreat Center as program, program director. And if you're not familiar with Pinecrest, Pinecrest is located in Fayette County. Uh, it is in the Wolf River watershed. Uh, we've done a lot of activities out there. Uh, University of Memphis does water quality testing uh, at Pinecrest. I'm sure uh, Charity will be sharing more about Pinecrest with you tonight. Charity now leads the initiative to protect the dark skies of Fayette County and have the area near Pinecrest designated as an international dark sky park. This initiative began a little over a year ago after seeing the Milky Way at Pinecrest and visiting the Picket Pogue Dark Sky Park in Northeast Tennessee. We look forward to hearing uh, Charity's program tonight, and please join me in welcoming Charity Siebert to our presentation tonight. Thank you. Charity? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys and introduce myself a little bit more, and then I need to start the presentation. Got it. Thank you for bearing with me on this. Um, yeah, so again, I'm Charity Siebert and the program director at Pinecrest Camp and Retreat Center. Um, I wanna start off by letting everybody know that I'm an IDA advocate. I did not study physics. I'm not an astronomer. I don't teach astronomy or physics or anything like that, but I do share nature with children, families, and the general public. And since realizing what a precious resource we have at Pinecrest, 
Um, and like you said, seeing the Picket Pogue State Natural Area and realizing that something like this could happen and, and finding my way through this, this is what brings me to you today. Um, so, uh, you know, I've just been really excited about connecting as many people as possible with this and hopefully getting ourselves on the map here in West Tennessee and making it feel less like we're put in a corner over here in this side of the state, but really shining uh, over here. We've got so much great things to offer. The Wolf River watershed and that system is incredible. Um, so I want to take you all on a walk on the dark side. So to kind of further help you understand where Pinecrest is, we're about 30 minutes from Collierville, an hour from downtown Memphis. If you take Poplar and just keep going on Highway 57, uh, you'll end up at Pinecrest just before you get to the little town of LaGrange. Um, we do occupy the ancestral land of the Chickasaw and we continue to share that recognition and reflection of that history. In 1960, the Presbytery of the Mid-South sought a wilderness retreat center um, and purchased the 453 acres that we now sit on for camp. And in March 2021, we, Pinecrest, became an official independent nonprofit organization rooted in the Presbyterian faith and continuing the same mission that was begun in the 60s as a camp and retreat center. And through this faith, we welcome anyone and everyone to Pinecrest, regardless of any faith or background. And like you said, we're in the Wolf River watershed. If, you know, I'm sitting at my office desk at Pinecrest and I throw a rock for a mile to the south, it would land very close to the Ghost River section of the Wolf River and that um, Mineral Slough State Natural Area. So that's just south of us. What do we do? As you know, summer camp is our OG. That's what we do right now. We're in the middle of summer camp. We host about 450 kids a, a summer through our week long summer camp programs. So that's at the heart of our mission, but the annual events also support us throughout the year, like our Plenty in the Pines Thanksgiving meal, um, the Firefly Drive-In and Camp Food and Cocktails, among others. And then with our Go Outside educational programming, we've been seeing an increase in our field trip programs throughout the school year, working with um, local schools. And recently we just, collected specimens of the ghost, blue ghost firefly, which is great because we're in the ghost river area as well. But this specific species of firefly has as yet been undocumented in our region. So we're pretty proud of finding that. And we've been in touch with some firefly researchers who have confirmed our findings and will eventually update their publications on this. And then as well as just the other night, we collected specimens of the snappy sink firefly, which is a synchronous firefly that we have here in West Tennessee. Who knew that we had those? They flash rapidly, the whole forest lights up and blinks as like a forest heartbeat. It's pretty amazing. You don't have to go to East Tennessee to see synchronous fireflies. And then what do we wanna become? We've got a lot of great plans for the future, but keeping up all of this momentum, we would like to be recognized for our dark skies. Um, you know, you've probably heard of ecotourism, which the Wolf River Conservancy is an awesome, probably the number one player in that in West Tennessee. Um, and we would like to also become a destination for astrotourism. That's a new little buzzword we want to get excited about. We would like to draw in more people to come see the stars or maybe eventually with through the educational programming to kind of turn back the clock on some of this light pollution issue that we're gonna talk about and maybe be able to uh, have people be able to see the Milky Way or more stars in their own backyard. Um, so let's vote. We're gonna go ahead and run that poll now. So I'd like you to take a second. There are two poll questions and we can run those consecutively. While you're clicking through those, you can also consider the quote. Ooh, ooh, no. 
the quote below, only in the darkness can you see the stars, which is true on so many levels. And that has inspired so many people in our past. And what kind of inspiration will we lose if we're not able to see the cosmos? So we have one respondent who says they can see the Milky Way from their property, which is still good. Have you ever seen the Milky Way? Yeah. I'm seeing more yeses, which is great. I'm glad to see that you know, in talking to a group on a Wolf River Conservancy lecture series, I assume that some of you all have been to these natural places and had the opportunity to see the Milky Way where a lot of people have not. So thank you for responding to that. More people here in this Ellis lecture tonight have seen the Milky Way than not or aren't sure of, and that's a great sign. Um, the statistics are in general, and we can go ahead and close this poll out. The statistics in general are that 80% of uh, the population has not ever seen the Milky Way. So only about 20% if we look at the world everywhere. So thank you for sharing that information. Um, and when I first moved to Memphis, I didn't even realize you could see the Milky Way from West Tennessee. 100 years ago though, everybody could see the Milky Way from just about anywhere you were. Um, that's kind of when, you know, electrical lighting was still picking up and getting implemented. Uh, just a little over a hundred years ago, you could have been anyone anywhere to see it. And it's best seen in the summer in the Northern hemisphere while in the spring and autumn, we kind of tilt over it. So if you're able to see it, summertime now is the best. Um, let me click through to the next slide. Okay, my computer's being a little slow. Okay, there we go. So, and its dramatic presence has led to a lot of stories throughout um, culture throughout the world, inspired by its presence and how it was created. The Cherokee told that it was a trail of cornmeal spilled from the mouth of a godlike dog that had been coming to steal the grain until villagers scared it off with their drums. And so, you know, if we can educate each other, educate our friends and family, or do presentations like this, wherever you are, um, on the on proper lighting and light pollution, we will be able to increase the numbers of who actually gets to see this amazing sight. When it comes to the night sky out at Pinecrest and rural areas, you kind of get lost in the stars. This photograph was taken at Pinecrest on a particularly wondrously dark night. Um, and even some of the astronomers that come out to do our, our dark sky readings, they seem to even get lost in the stars themselves, even though they have a lot more experience in seeing it than I do and picking things out like that. Um, we think you know one constellation, but in these dark skies, there's about 1500 stars that you can see with your naked eye. So you really do get lost in them. Um, so in the purpose of our becoming an international dark sky park is to bring awareness to this issue and to educate and provide sky viewing experiences and educational programming for more people in the area. Plus we need to work with our community, our nearby communities um, and neighbors to be stewards of our local natural heritage. All right, so going into the light pollution. Okay, I think they're gonna pop in. I, the words should be coming up. Technical difficulties. So apparent magnitude. Okay, we'll talk about that. Dome. Turbulence. Shield. Glare. Full cutoff. These are kind of our vocabulary for the night. Trespass. And Calvin. There are other things that affect our ability to see the night sky, but we'll really focus on this information tonight. So apparent magnitude is how bright does that thing in space seem to be 
to our human eyes. This is an anthropocentric measurement and not the true luminosity of a celestial object. This was a scale invented to gauge the brightness or faintness of a star. The higher the number, the fainter the star is and harder for us to see. In very dark skies, you are able to see so many more objects than those that have magnitudes at the faint end of the scale, including those. So Vega, which is overhead right now. So tonight, go step outside, that's your homework. Go look straight up and you'll see a nice bright twinkling star called Vega. Um, and that's basically our reference point of zero. Um, that's our zero star for the apparent magnitude scale. Jupiter, that big planet that comes by every now and then has a magnitude of about negative 2.2. A lot of people think when you ask them, what's the brightest star in the sky? They'll say the North Star. A lot of people think that. However, the North Star is easy to find if you know your way using the Big Dipper, but that is, it has an apparent magnitude of about two. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy, has an apparent magnitude of 3.55. And that they say is the farthest thing you can see in the night sky, the farthest thing. You can see up to a faintness or magnitude of five, but the farthest thing, which is kind of cool to think about is uh, the Andromeda galaxy with your naked eye. Um, when you, in, you know, going back to what is the brightest star in our night sky, uh, you can see it in January, in the winter, uh, earlier in the night. Right now, you'd have to stay up all night to see it. Uh, that would be serious with an apparent magnitude of negative 1.44. And then if you went out right in the daytime and took an apparent magnitude gauge, the sun's brightness is negative 26.7. So that's very bright to us since it is so close, only 93 million miles away. Now, the stars have their own influence on what we see in the night sky, but we're talking about light pollution today. There are three forms of light pollution. There's light dome or sky glow. There's trespass and glare. We'll get to all three of those. Um, dome or sky glow. That's the brightness on the horizon forming a dome of lights that obscure our view of the sky, even when we're not seemingly that close to the lights at all. The picture on the top right shows the dark night skies at Pinecrest, but there's a little dome of sky glow. Now I wanna tell y'all, this is not Memphis. This is something a little closer and we're still figuring it, that it's probably the town of Moscow. It's not that bright yet. Uh, that's something we would like to kind of tackle and harness and reverse in the future. Um, that's kind of west northwest of us. And then the lower right photo shows people uh, setting up, it's actually, I think, Rick Honey setting up. He's with the Memphis Astronomical Society and you might recognize where he is. That is at Shelby Farms with the sky glow of Memphis, um, of this like southeast view of Memphis. Um, we'll also to kind of talk about turbulence here. So especially in the summertime, you've got a lot of heat and energy pouring off of these cities. Um, just the heat from the lights alone, even winter can uh, obscure objects near the horizon, causing them to appear differently colored or affect and fluctuate their scintillation or twinkliness. And it affects our ability to see here on earth. Uh, but I got a little philosophical the other day when I was watching my son work on his Lego Millennium Falcon and putting that together. And I started to think about what if our light pollution, because I was putting this presentation together at the same time he was working on that, but what if light pollution it's so bad that here on Earth, it actually affects intergalactic space travel. Hopefully, we don't get that far gone in the future with this issue. Uh, something funny to think about. Okay, light pollution over the years. I'm very sorry if this gives you uncomfortable or distressing feelings, but it's fascinating and a little scary to watch this change. Yeesh, you know, it feels like we've grown at 2% per year but it feels a lot faster than that almost. I would like for you all to take a moment to put in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but click on Q&A and tell me, tell us what do you think is the number one biggest cause of light pollution worldwide? And maybe Kathy, you can kind of share some of those responses.
Oh yeah, I can see them. Street lighting. You can see them? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm gonna mute myself. Street lights. I knew you guys would get this. Y'all are so smart. Yeah. Street lights. That's the number one cause as of right now. Um, let me close this out. Thank you for sharing your responses, you guys. Street lights. So scientists, researchers, and naturalists are saying that light pollution is right up there with climate change and chemical pollution in its disastrous effects on the environment, but people really seem to forget about light pollution. Um, and if all of this scares you with all these street lights, there's so many of them, and it's really hard to talk to anybody at MLGW about anything, but we can, we can work on this. We can, we can figure something out. Just keep trying, right? Be the nail that sticks out. Street lights, uh, and light pollution in general is really one of the easiest types of pollution to remedy because all we have to do is switch off uh, maybe our back porch light. Do we really need that on all night? Maybe, um, you know, fixing these street lights with these $7 street lamp shields that prevent upward sky glow and glare. They're not that expensive. I know there's a lot to do, but if we can start working on these, and advocate for this lighting that makes sense, we'll be able to see a nicer night sky. And there's so many other things we'll talk about. All right, come on computer. I don't know why it's being so slow. Um, I click, yeah, there we go. Because look at what happens when we turn out the lights. That was sitting right there behind their house the whole time. Who knows what might be right behind your backyard under this veil, behind this veil of light. All right, moving on to the next cause of light pollution. We have glare. Ouch, yuck, right? Uh, this glare is when light enters our eyes at shallow angles and um, different frequencies, causing our eyes to react with fast restriction of the pupils and can cause pain or discomfort. I mean, it's, this is not even a real light we're looking at, but I mean, I guess it is real from our computers, but it's still very annoying to see this, but it also reduces our visual acuity. And if glare is in our eyes, we're really limited to what we can see, not only in the night sky, but for our safety. And you might be one of them, there are a lot of people I know who cannot drive at night because of all of this glare. That's unsafe, it's unhealthy. And then we have light trespass. This is an example, these are examples of light trespass when light is falling from outside of your property line and into your property line. And that comes up as a property rights issue. And if you are experiencing this, uh, hopefully you can talk to your neighbor or you can go to the IDA website, darksky.org, which I will share and put up on here later for more ideas on how you can manage this without you having to spend a lot of money on light blocking blinds and things like that. With home lighting, we really need to ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we just trying to be safe and light the steps and the driveway and prevent or be able to be burglars, you know, prevent crime? Or are we trying to be a beacon for ships entering a bay? I mean, if you live at a lighthouse, this might be ideal. <laughs> um, so when we're assessing our own lighting, or working with our local electric or utility company, maybe on upgrading to healthy quality lighting, we need to know about Kelvins. This is a big thing. Um, we've seen a lot of these switchovers from our high pressure sodium streetlights to these LED 5000-ish Kelvin street lamps that give out crisp white light like the moon and you can see so well, but there's an issue here. But let's talk about what Kelvin is. Kelvin is a measure of the color correlated temperature, color temperature, color correlated. So sometimes it's shown as the number CCT, um, but it's a characteristic of the visible light that we can see. And that most newer LED lights will share this information on the boxes and the unit of measurement could be confused with lumens. They're also up there in the thousands, but you need to note that that is very different. The color temperature is really important for your health, the health of our ecosystems. 
um, and the ability to see in the night sky. Uh, for dark sky purposes, Kelvins and your health, it should be limited to a maximum of about 3000 Kelvins, that warmer incandescent light. Sunrise and sunset is around 1850 Kelvins. Um, but we've seen so many municipalities switching over to these LEDs. Now I'm not saying LEDs in general are bad, right? But these bright white, uh, cool white, color correlated temperatures of 3000 plus um, are really affecting things. So we can find these LEDs in the 3000 and below and they give off more of that warmer light. Um, so yes, LEDs are a major reduction in CO2 and energy costs, um, but let's talk about the dangers of blue light um, and what light pollution in general affects. So light pollution can affect your human health, ecosystems, energy costs, safety and crime, and natural heritage. Uh, scotobiology is a cool new word that dates all the way back to 2003. It's kind of a mashup, right? We've got scoto, and if you've studied Greek, you know that's the word for dark. And so here we have the study of life in the dark. Um, so we already kind of have some knowledge of our circadian rhythms, the rhythm of light and darkness, and we know it's essential for many biological processes from our sight to photosynthesis to metabolism, movement, mating behaviors, and more. Humans, animals, plants, and even microbes are dependent on the light cycles of dark and light to produce positive effects in living. So you may have heard of phototropism where a plant will follow the sun throughout the day, but have you heard of scototropism? So there are actually some plants that lean into the dark areas for seed release or internodal growth, not just for roots. Uh, philodendrons will grow towards dark skies and trees and tropical forests. And if you do a lot of gardening, maybe you've heard of long day or short day plants. You might also consider them short night or long night plants because they need that night cycle. Um, we're also keeping in mind that some natural light will occur in the night time from moonlight and starlight. Total darkness is rarely absolute, uh, but these natural factors are what we've all you know, evolved with since the beginning of time. So we're pretty used to there are some nights during the month where the moon is super bright. We're all, the plants are used to, sometimes there is no moon at all, but there's a bit of star glow. Um, so we're learning more and more about these negative effects of less darkness, um, with especially with human health. A lot of, we've heard about, you know, if you are having trouble sleeping, don't play on your phone or be in front of a device uh, about an hour before you go to bed. Keep that, turn that off, turn it on at your play mode. Light disrupts our sleep processes, any light at all, really. Even the warm lights can disrupt our sleep processes. But blue light in particular, uh, you've got a blue light filter on your phone, you've got a blue light filter on your laptop, because the blue light has the more serious effects that we need to take stock of. So we have got, you know, this circadian rhythm, right? We've got a biological clock that understands when it's dark, it's time to shut down and rest. The word circadian itself comes from the Latin circa, around, and diem for the day, circa, diem, circadian. Our body's processes are optimized around that 24 hour cycle. We have a central pacemaker in our brain called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, SCN, which operates those peripheral clocks it, that operate our mood, our cardiovascular functioning, immune system, sleep responses, attention and cognition, cell production, metabolism, the reproduction system, and the endocrine system. Blue light in particular seriously inhibits melatonin secretion from your pineal gland, like this lady here is doing at night. That's definitely not what you should do, although we've probably all been a little guilty of that from time to time when we can't sleep and it just kind of exacerbates that problem. But even if you're not looking at your phone every night, um, if you're driving at night often or you're walking around in the evening, taking a night walk or something, and you're exposed to more of these blue light street lamps, 
that's still going to affect your melatonin production in the evening. Um, and then, you know, lack of melatonin not only affects our sleep, but it affects all those other things as well. And then I just mentioned decreased immune function in general just increases our risk for so many diseases and viruses. Um, there's a new report from the American Medical Association. So a lot of these doctors are getting together about these blue light issues. Um, there's a study that they published called Human and Environmental Effects of light emitting diode community lighting. So this relates to those street lights. White LED street lights are currently being marketed to cities and towns throughout the country in the name of energy efficiency and long-term cost savings, yeah. But such lights have a spectrum containing a strong spike at the wavelength that most effectively suppresses melatonin during the night. It is estimated that white LED lamps are at least five times more powerful in influencing your circadian rhythms than a high pressure sodium light based on melatonin suppression. Although data are still emerging, some evidence supports a long-term increase in the risk for cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity from chronic sleep disruption. Recent large surveys found that brighter residential nighttime lighting is associated with reduced sleep time dissatisfaction with sleep quality, nighttime awakenings, excessive sleepiness, impaired daytime functioning, and obesity. Aberrant light exposure is linked to, you know, all these cognitive disruptions as well, altered behaviors, impaired attention. We understand, and then we have night shifts to think about too. Yes, there are people who have to work the night shifts. Unfortunately, they're more likely to have these previously mentioned issues as well. And then just driving through these extremely brightly lit uh, streetways and roadways, uh, you've got the trouble with glare and this pupillary constriction can cause discomfort, but also the inability to see properly when you're trying to drive and can cause issues driving at night and seeing things pop out of the shadows from that glare. The city of Davis, California just began to switch over 2,600 street lights to a 4,000 Kelvin color correlated temperature bulb with 2,100 something lumens. After they did 1,400 of those lights, uh, residents complained so intensely that the city actually had to go back and put in lower Kelvin and lower lumen street lights and replace 650 of those in the residential areas. And that caused the city to lose $325,000 trying to do the right thing and then having to redo it. So let's try to do this right in the first place. But like I said, we're not dissing LEDs in general, just the right color correlated temperature one. <laughs> okay. Um, and then while we're on the subject of this, from an environmental justice perspective, uh, there's been studies on surveillance in urban housing development areas the excessive bright lighting in those areas. Um, and then it goes all the way back to the 18th century lantern laws that targeted black, indigenous, and people of color, forcing them to walk with lights and lanterns um, for increased surveillance. This, or sorry, though the procedure and labels of the tactics have changed over 200 years, recent studies definitely do show increased lighting in low income housing developments that show a continuance of militarization, but at the same time exacerbating crime because there's actual studies also about brighter lighting increases crime. And then it actually exacerbates the health disparities in these communities for those who live in low income housing. All right. Plant and wildlife disruptions. There's quite a bulk of information here on this and, and might already have some things coming to mind. It, uh, yeah, the bugs around the lights, the birds that can't see where they're going when they're migrating. Um, there's so much more to this. We know birds are attracted to those bright lights and are known to regularly collide with buildings in brightly lit areas. And sadly, some locations report hundreds of birds being injured or killed on a nightly basis at certain buildings in certain cities because many birds following the celestial bodies at night in the night sky while they're migrating 
And then they get very disoriented and confused by these city lights. And it's exacerbated on these flyways. And in Canada, they actually have a whole organization known as FLAP that collects dead birds in the cities at night, the ones who hit the buildings and or become confused, disoriented. Um, and they do research and education. FLAP actually stands for Fatal Light Awareness Program. Um, there's some interesting studies that were done in the 50s and 60s with indigo buntings in planetariums where they brought in the indigo bunting specimen, put their celestial guiding stars on the planetarium's dome, released the buntings, they flew in the direction that they would. They later reversed the direction of the stars. The birds flew the opposite way and went straight to those stars again. Um, then you've got mammals and plants and birds living near these light sources, uh, mammals and birds, we'll go to plants later, they uh, can take longer if they're living near these excessively lit areas, take longer to develop their seasonal fur or feather colorations. Some might take longer to leave for migration or hibernation, brumation. They may miss specific opportunities in the environment that match their biological systems. Uh, we've known that there's been an extremely fast decline of bird and insect species in the past 40 or so years. And that's become a big topic of discussion among scientists and naturalists. And so this scotobiology has become a real legitimate science now in, in learning about this. Uh, we have fireflies at night that are uh, at risk of complete extinction because most species avoid brightly lit areas during their mating flash season, combined with increase in chemical lawn sprays and habitat loss. Moths and firefly or moths and mayflies around these street lights at night. You know, it's pretty fascinating to watch them, especially when you're a kid, or maybe a little annoying or or you know, scary, bug you out a little bit. But unfortunately, about one third of those insects die by morning due to exhaustion from staying within that light realm or due to predation, because clearly there's big concentration in a lit up area. Just there's a buffet, right? Um and then insects living near these artificial light sources often confuse the pavement with water. That polarizing effect that light has when it hits the pavement um, makes insects think that that's a pond or a creek or some kind of water source where they would lay their eggs. And so they're, they've been known to actually try to lay their eggs on the asphalt and reducing you know, our, the reproduction. And so this, these populations are, are really suffering. And there's a variety of causes, of course, but we do need to take into account these as well. Plants in proximity to these all night light sources definitely confuse their phenological habits, phenological meaning uh, time-based, budding out maybe too early in the spring or too, uh, leaving their leaves on too late in the fall and missing those opportunities to shut down or open up in time, maybe missing those pollinators when they come through, um, yeah. So photosynthesis of smaller pan plants can also cause overproduction in their plant growth, especially important in aquatic systems causing algal blooms and similar things. So when plants and animals are measuring shorter dark periods and longer artificial light periods, you can see that their behaviors are severely altered. And then going to the cost factor, it's, it's certainly costing us in carbon dioxide emissions and our bills. But yes, we are switching over to those LEDs. At this point though, we are still accounting for about 15 tons of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere through residential lighting alone. Now, I'm not here to trash talk outdoor lighting. Still, you might be thinking, uh, I mean, I guess I could, could turn out some of my lights at home, but I really want my home to look warm and inviting, or I really need to spotlight this area to reduce crime. What about safety? Can we just use lower Kelvin lighting? And those are all really important things to think about. And we can make good lighting at our home. We can start there at our home. We know we can make a difference in our own home. We know we can make it safe and inviting keep it, be able to see the stars, um, might be able to do that if we switch over, um, maybe be able to protect our own selves, plants and animals nearby, and be able to protect our bills and energy costs. Um, 
I really want to hit on the safety thing first, because some of you might think that the more lights you have, the safer uh, you have an area. Okay. Uh, there was a study in Chicago where they previously had dark alleys. They did a crime study of the area. They lit those alleys. Crime spiked. Okay. Criminals really don't like to hang out in dark places. They don't like the darkness as much as we know, you know, maybe are uncomfortable with it. They, you know, um, I think most property crime occurs during the light of day anyway. Speaking of that, let's find the bad guy. You might be able to see him back there. Oh, it, it may have took you a second, right? Bright lights means more safety, right? No, nah. I'm a little blinded here by this glaring floodlight on the side of this house. So let's see what happens when we obscure that light a little bit, leaving the light on the sidewalk, but there you can see so much better beyond that light. So it's not that more lighting helps pre or prevent crime, but quality lighting helps prevent crime. So if you'd like to try taking action at home, you can do uh, your home residential lighting audit, and we can find this information again at the darksky.org website and you know go through those topics is the light useful like is it really useful really really useful is it targeted is it directed downward where it's needed um keeping that out of our eyes uh below eye level and low light levels keeping in mind that 3000 kelvin or less whenever possible really using a higher kelvin bright, cool, white lighting is best when you're in the bathroom or the kitchen, when you need bright light to see, maybe when you're crafting, so maybe a craft room light. That's really when those are most helpful. Um, so is there surface reflection of the light on the ground? Am I controlling that light? Is it on only when it's useful? Are we leaving things on all night? Can we install a timer, a motion detector? Can we just turn it off when we're uh, when we're done for the evening. And then that warm color temperature, those bright white lights have a tendency to hit the pavement and bounce right back up, causing more glare, causing more sky glow, and uh, just being wasteful of light in general. So in this example, the resident would have assessed that there was excessive bright, maybe unnecessary and unshielded lighting. Um, full cutoff refers to when the light bulb is protected and it's covered to the bottom point of the bulb so that the light is directed downward and we can't see it when we're on a horizontal plane uh, or zero angle with that fixture. Um, they, this homeowner would have seen that they really only need, needed one quality light fixture for this particular um, example. This can result in saving money, uh, lower energy costs, happier neighbors. Um, it looks like it has more enhanced ambiance to the home as well, and their homeowner's ability to see more stars in the night sky. Here's another example of a commercial application of quality lighting um, of an upgrade. So we are seeing this full shield, lights are aimed down, now you can see in uh, the street lamp, the first street lamp on the left, that it's unshielded, which means that the bulb is below the fixture, light can spread upwards. But when you have a fully shielded fixture, they can add this seven to $10 shield and it directs light downward, prevents the bulb from being below the fixture. And look at the difference that it makes. I mean, just if I was driving by this, I'm assuming it's an auto repair shop, I would be really impressed with their design of the lighting. It makes it feel warm and inviting. And like, I would want to use this business rather than something that's in my eyes, frustrating me, uh, kind of embarrassing to look at. It's, it's too much. Um, and so again, looking for those warm colors, downward lighting for your home. If you are able to make these improvements yourself, you can go to online retailers or hardware stores. And I tried this the other day at our local hardware store, the big box one, and looked for those dark sky seal of approvals. You can find those. You can go online and type in dark sky friendly lighting. 
Dark Sky Approved is great. Some of them have not gone through the approval process and they still have quality lights. Um, I'm going to show you a few examples I pulled. The first one on the top left retails for only about $30. And all of these have really great designs. There are different applications. So if you need something on your porch steps or above your home or over your garage or an entryway, they have different designs and they look really nice. You're going to be the talk of the neighborhood if you start making improvements and then maybe you can influence your own neighbors. Um, you can also do some things like a little DIY if you're crafty. Like over here on the left, you have a cute little galvanized bucket that be can become a light. It's fully shielding the bulb inside. On the right, you would have to DIY this a little bit because the light bulb inside there is going to hang through that translucent area, which is still going to cause some upward sky glow or, uh, you know, the light's going to escape upward. So what I've heard recommended and what we're going to do is add a layer of tin foil to the inside of that. And if it's, you know, kind of translucent like this, you won't even notice it, but you're going to help direct that light downward um, to its application. So those are the, some of the things that you can do at home, but you can also help us at Pinecrest. And now what exactly is this International Dark Sky Park thing? So the International Dark Sky Association designates locations around the world that go through a rigorous application process. And they have multiple designation types from International Dark Sky Reserve to, um, I think there's a, a quality urban or neighborhood designation. Um, so if you got together with your neighborhood and put something together, you can actually apply as, as a, like a residential area. But International Dark Sky Park is what we're going for. And that there's no minimum or maximum land space area that has to be a part of it. But we do have to meet certain qualifications. We have to be nominated to be able to apply for this process, which we already have by our local International Dark Sky chapter for Western Tennessee. They've already sent us in. So we're on phase two, which is going through the process. If and when we're able to become an International Dark Sky Park, we would join the ranks of hundreds of locations worldwide. Um, some nearby, like at the Pickett Pogue State, Na uh, State Park and State Natural Area and the Obed Wild and Scenic River in Northeast Tennessee. Um, I think there's another one in Tennessee. There's also the Buffalo River in Arkansas. And then the only other camp and retreat center in the list worldwide that I could find is in Texas called U Bar U and they're only 96 acres. Um, they're far from a city, but they do have some, you know, little municipalities that they're working with to help keep it that way and maintain that designation. And for us, we've got 453 acres. We also are adjacent to Tennessee or, you know, TDEC, Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation property and the Wolf River um, State Natural Area, Ghost River Natural Area, a wildlife management area, and then still lots of farm and forest land, uh, privately owned properties. So we are working with the TDEC uh, manager of the area for the state natural areas, uh, division of, sorry, division of natural areas to um, provide an, a uh, one of our public viewing places um, in that parking area at Mineral Slough. Um, we're working with other local agencies. We've got letters of support from the Wolf River Conservancy and others to, you know, boast our, uh, the, add to our application. Uh, we need to continue to work with these local municipalities. That's going to be critical going forward. Um, since they're quickly developing, but we want to showcase and work with them showcasing that keeping the night sky dark does not mean no lighting at all. I think that's a common misconception. And then we also plan to host more stargazing events. We have to have a public education component to this as well. We welcome the Memphis Astronomical Society. Uh, and eventually we want to design and install an educational kiosk that will help inform our visitors of lighting and the dark skies and then the dark sky lighting projects that we have uh, going forward. We have these 
lovely dark skies out here. Sorry for the um, the quality of this picture. It's a little blurry. Night photography is a little difficult, but this is pretty cool. This is one of the photo photographs from Pinecrest. The first thing you might notice is that band of lights kind of sw swirling upwards into the night sky. Those are a series of SpaceX satellites, the Starlink. Those were on their way up. And this has been a major concern with uh, astronomers and stargazers as a night sky distraction, a man-made distraction. We know SpaceX plans to put about 12,000 of these into orbit. Uh, before SpaceX, there were only 2,000-ish satellites only <laughs> in the night sky. And then with Starlink, it is the most bright at sunrise and sunset due to solar positioning and the shapes of these satellites. Now, SpaceX has a page on their website detailing how they're working with astronomers uh, towards two goals in protecting night skies. Number one is making the satellites generally invisible to the naked eye within a week of their launch. The way that they're designed is to minimize that uh, noticeability. Minimize it, and number two is minimizing Starlink's impact on astronomy by darkening the satellites so that they do not saturate observatory detectors. You might also notice in this photograph the dome. This is looking north-ish. Uh, so that dome is that one that we mentioned earlier to the west. And then you also might see the Big Dipper in there and then lots of other stars. And then the next photo shows uh, Rick Honey's laser pointer pointing out Jupiter, which is hanging out among Sagittarius. And then Saturn is to the left of Jupiter. One of the other things that we have to do before we apply and then ongoing, we have to maintain, is doing dark sky readings. We use a special little handheld meter called the SQM, the Sky Quality Meter. You push a button and hold it up, and in a few seconds, it gives you a number, and that tells you your dark sky value. It's kind of its own ma apparent magnitude, basically. Um, so we have to do this throughout the year. We've tried to do it every month or every other month, uh, when the moon is not visible and the sun is at least 18 degrees below the horizon to prevent any, you know, sun uh, light pollution of its own. We have to have a reading of 21.1 or more. That means darker skies. And its measurement is in magnitude arcs per second, which sounds really complicated, but it refers to the apparent magnitude in a way, and we kind of know that from earlier. If we were to go out there and take a reading and it says negative 26, oh, that means the sun is out. We did it during the day, right? So at night we go out, and even though the stars can be bright when the moon is not out, we're basically collecting all the starlight into one star, and that's the reading that we get. So 21.1 is basically the sky at night as one star giving us that very faint reading. Anything higher is nice and dark, uh, and that's good. So we want to be higher than that. However, we are right on the cusp. Some nights we're below 21.1. Some nights we're higher. We have to do, you know, at least six readings each night, throw out the first one, take the rest, and average them out. Um, we're right there. We're so close, which is why it's so important that we really uh, and we are, we're starting to work with those local municipalities. And I want to give a shout out now to Bolivar Electric Company for getting involved, working with us. Um, and we have to, part of our process for this is that we also have to retrofit all 17 street lights that we have placed throughout Pinecrest. Um, we have had them out there for many years in our parking areas near the cabins to make it easier for our guests who aren't very much always used to the dark dark night skies that we have out there but we have to retrofit all of those to dark sky friendly lighting so we're going to have new 3000 or less kelvin bulbs put in and fully shielded street lights directing all of that light downward and not up to the sky. So I cannot wait for that to happen. However, we have to raise the money for each one of those lights. So we've started a program 
to retrofit those where a donor can, you know, uh, donate that money, the 150, they would get a plaque, a little four by six plaque that we'll put on the street light in honor of whatever it is they so choose. And then once we get all of those in place and ready to go, we work with Bolivar, they come in, they send the guys and they've learned so much about this process that they'll come in and add all that to our property. And then if we have great enough feedback, we're hoping that maybe they'll take their own initiative and work on that as they upgrade those street lights going through Hardeman and Fayette County. Um, and then eventually start working with Chickasaw Electric who works on the Rossville, Moscow areas, uh, which is on our way, on the way out to Pinecrest. We have already raised the money for six of these lights um, and we're very excited about that. If you're interested in getting your name or your organization or your mission on a plaque um, as an honorarium, it's only 150 and then you're gonna help preserve the night sky at Pinecrest for forever. It'll be there forever. And that's really awesome. Um, so thank you for considering that. Get your name on a light today. To finish this out, oh, yep. Here's the sample of fully shielded street lights. Um, just one last look at those before we go, what is acceptable and what is not. And hopefully, you know, we, it's super simple. If you're looking at the light fixture at a zero degree plane and you can see the bulb, that's going to cause upward glow. If you're looking at it, you can't see the bulb, but you see the light coming down. That's good. So finally from John Barentine, um, He's the, I think, the vice president of the International Dark Sky Association. Done well, LEDs could save the planet. Raining in light pollution, carbon dioxide emissions, but done carelessly, it could be devastating. And one last thing, I'll let y'all take a minute to read that. <laughs> and maybe that's part of the craziness of the world today. We go so fast. Do we take enough time? Do we even have the opportunity to stop and look at the stars and be in awe and be inspired like Martin Luther King Jr., like philosophers through history? So let's protect ourselves, our wildlife, our pockets, our pocketbooks, and our natural heritage. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, here are some links for the information, if you want to visit more of these or participate, darksky.org is the one that I'm the International Dark Sky Advocate that I've been advocating for. If you want to get with Memphis Astronomical Society for some of their get togethers, you can find out lots of more information in these other organizations. And then if y'all want to contact me about any of this, here's my contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charity. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, let's give people just a couple of minutes to uh, add questions to the Q&A feature on the, on the webinar. Um, yes, you've given us a really good presentation and you've given us lots of um, to think about and um, also some concrete actions we can take to um, to rectify this problem. Uh, I'll start with a question from me since we haven't gotten any others yet. Oh yes, I have one, which is um, how would you, if we wanted to approach this on a community-wide scale, I guess I'm wondering how you are, uh, how you're working with your local municipalities to um, get them to change their lighting. How do you approach that? So I have reached out directly to some of the mayors of these little towns that are undergoing a lot of growth to get their support, at least in working with their utility companies and saying, you know, we support this. We want you to use this type of bulb and this type of shield, please, you know, when you're working on it. Um, I'm hoping to be able to sit down on some of these town council meetings. I haven't got there yet. Um, but I'm hoping to in the future. And uh, I think there are a few community days coming up in the fall for some of these local places where I can, you, know, you can set up a booth, you can set up an information booth for their little town jamboree, the Bolivar 
is Bolivar's far enough away, but it'd be great to have their support too. They've always got great Friday night fun going on. So we're planning on maybe hosting some of those and then hosting our own opportunities at Pinecrest. Um, once summer camp has kind of rounded out for the summer, we hope to have some stargazing nights and educational opportunities at Pinecrest. Night hikes, stargazing, lots of fun. So public education first, and then, um, yeah. and then uh, try the harder things. I imagine also it would be um, beneficial to point out to the communities out east that what a great resource maybe economic resource dark skies are that it sets them apart and makes them more uh, appealing i think so. yeah i mean and as far as possibly as far as fayette county goes pinecrest and albert sell ourselves we're possibly one of the number one draws of tourism other than programs at the wolf river which we're we're all right next to each other. So it really goes hand in hand in bolstering any form of tourism, you know, to this area. So Moscow and Rossville have great little restaurants and little shops that are popping up that we refer people to after they come out for an evening at Pinecrest or on their way, you know, stop at so-and-so's restaurant to grab a bite. And then, uh, so we're, you know, kind of feeding back into the community as well getting these folks out here. Plus we're also right on the way to Pickwick. Um, so a lot of people pass through here and we'd be, you know, a stop along the way. I apologize for the dogs barking in the background. I'm gonna ask this question and let you answer while I deal with them. Um, this is from um, Melissa and she asks, she says, I have trouble processing the idea that 80% of the world's population has never seen the Milky Way. Is the entire world so urbanized? I'd picture vast rural populations on other continents. Thanks. I guess my best response in that um, statistic that was pulled from the IDA is the fact that vast rural regions don't always equal a big population. You know, we kind of see that when it comes to voting time and we see these you know, national polls and the colorations of our voting maps and that rural doesn't always mean lots of people. Um, so, or people who have even really considered it. Um, and even if you live in a rural area and you don't know, you don't think about it or your residential lights are just so aberrant that you, you can't really look up. But yeah, I mean, most of the world's population is urbanized. So that's the statistic that they have on their website. We could look into that some more. That's very interesting. Yeah, the urbanization of the world, it's amazing. Here's a question. Are there financial incentives for municipalities to change their lighting to dark sky? Approved, uh, dark sky approved lighting? If not, shouldn't there be incentives in key areas? A study of the entire US should be done to prioritize dark areas. I love it, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, certainly the cost is one of the first incentives. Um, and you have to factor in the human health cost too, right? Yes, there's the monetary cost. But if we're switching to these LED lights, we don't have to buy the bulb that is brighter. The bulb that is 3000 Kelvins or less, automatic, it's a, they're about the same in price from what I've learned from the Bolivar Electric Company who's shared so much information with me. So that right there is a no-brainer. We just need to tell them that's what we want. Um, to add the shield in for the street lamps, that's minimal cost, seven to $10 per street lamp. So I get we may not be able to do all of them at once, but they can be added to the systems that are already in place. Incentive-wise, um, that's a possibility. I know that the town, the, the town of Jamestown, Tennessee, which is the closest to Pickett Pope, uh, those, uh, those folks over there worked with the council and created a lighting ordinance that all uh, in commercial 
lighting and residential that might affect the night sky, it all has to be done with dark sky approved fixtures or, you know, um, ordinances. Mind. So that town has done that. That's a rural community in Tennessee. They made that happen. They recognize the value of the astro tourism that it brought to their town and it puts them on a map. So that's, that's a great incentive right there. Um, and once you're on the map, you're literally on a map that people can search for. And there are people nowadays who are Googling, where can I go see the constellations, the Milky Way, whatever it is they're trying to find, even if they're amateurs. Then you factor in all the star parties and the professionals who get into this. Um, yeah, I think incentive-wise, it's pulling from all those little details. Otherwise... I'm not sure if there's like a like a give back or instead of program a specific program. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I think that that is it for our questions, Charity. Unless there's something um, you'd like to add, I, I'm really glad you came uh, and did this presentation for us. Um, it's just wonderful information to share. So um, thank you so much. Thanks y'all for having me. And if anybody thinks of anything later or wants to get involved with us at Pinecrest, please reach out. We would love to have any, any help, any interest, uh, any support. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, thank you, Charity. And we will be, uh, for those of you attending tonight, uh, we are recording this program. So you can search for that later on. You'll, you'll receive an email with details about that. Um, thank all of you for coming. Uh, for joining us on this presentation tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that on our website, you'll find our activity calendar, which is just uh, chock full of activities, including some new um, activities on the Wolf River Greenway, um, various kinds of activities that you should uh, definitely check out. We've got a Project Wet workshop on the schedule now and lots of other things. So um, please check out our website and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good night. So Charity, thanks again. That was just wonderful. Night, y'all. Charity, it was great. Thank you so much. Very, very right. interesting.